Hello, and welcome to another episode of the B2B Leadership Podcast. My name's Nils Vinya, and today my guest is Mike Wolber. Mike, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks a ton, Nils. I'm super happy to be here. Hey, I'm excited to chat with you today. But but first, uh, let's get into the audience and give them some context about who you are, where you're working today, and what your role is. Uh, happy to start there. My name is Mike Wolber, and I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Rent Dynamics. We are a property tech company, so really focused on technology for real estate. Uh, we'd call it prop tech. And I hit my one-year anniversary next Tuesday, uh, December Ooh. 14th. So right really, on. really serving as our, our go-to-market leader to really help scale our business across sales, account management, and marketing. And we're having an absolute field day. That's uh, wonderful. I'm super excited. Now, you and I got connected a number of years ago, way back at the company you were working at previously, G5, and when we both lived in Bend, Oregon. Um, and would love for you to share a little bit about the story of how you got into your first people leadership position, which I know was at G5. Yeah, uh, you're going to probably have to stop me because I'm going to get so excited as we go back in time. <laughs> but let's do it. So uh, in 2015, I left Nike, uh, really this like incredible Fortune 500 experience and stepped into my first startup that quickly became a scale up. And that was G5. Um, okay, same hold on. Hang on. Hang on just one sec, because I'm going to ask a few questions in throughout here, because that's a big jump to go from Nike, which was obviously an incredible worldwide brand, uh, phenomenal organization, incredible culture. And then you said, you know what, I'm going to leave this incredible place and I'm going to go move to this small town called Bend <laughs> and this even smaller company called G5. Um, what was the kind of behind that shift and what gave you the confidence to even make that move? So I was at Nike for about five years and always worked in product creation technology. And in, I mean, billions of dollars, 35 billion was the revenue when I left. And one of the single biggest things that I observed during my five years at Nike was that technology that other companies were bringing into Nike were what really were what were driving the change. And so I saw all this change management happening as we implemented world-class tech, Informatica, Tableau, mm -hmm. and ultimately got to the point where I wanted to go be a problem solver as well, which became getting into technology myself. So it was this accident but also intentional decision to step into a technology company so I could hopefully become that problem solver for other small and big size companies. Mm. And Bend, uh, coincidentally, is where we'd, we'd gotten married a couple years prior. So it was an opportunity to go live where we'd initially fallen in love. That's fantastic. Okay, awesome story. All right, tell us about the... the well, let's first start with the just overall picture of the trajectory of what happened at G5 over the next several years. And then I want to come back to how you got into your first leadership position there. Yeah, so it was the probably best and most like accidental timing ever. I joined G5 in April of 2015. And within about three months, G5 had a strategic exit from Volition, private equity into peak. And that was really this like instant transition from being a startup that was being relatively scrappy to being a scale up with a real trajectory to become a real you know, sizable technology company. And I just happened to be in the right place. And I think I capitalized correctly to really mm -hmm. swiftly move from being a senior level individual contributor. I started as a sales engineer. Uh, and within 18 months, I was the director of that team of two that I scaled to a team of 12. Wow. And within three years after that, I was uh, a second line leader over an organization of about 80 people. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, just through a few, you know, a few months after joining and then all of a sudden the strategic exit from one PE firm to another, a whole different ballgame from a culture perspective, company perspective, and you were able to capitalize on it. So what was it about the position that you were in? Yes, there's a timing element, of course, but you mentioned I was able to capitalize on it. What does that really mean? So I think one of my, my big kind of core values and philosophies that I've developed over the last six or seven years has been this absolute obsession with customers, like really understanding how we can best serve customers. Because to me as a salesperson, if you understand your customers at scale, there's a good chance that you understand how to go win the market. 
because your customers are a representation of the market. And when you're trying to grow a business, especially like a, a high growth technology company, you've got to keep the back door closed. You have to keep retention in order. And yeah. I think for me, being in sales, but straddling into account management, I really quickly saw an opportunity to have a seat at the table by understanding our customers and our market and being an internal evangelist for the things we could do better to positively impact revenue, to impact internal morale, and to, you know, eventually aid in growing the business like we wanted to. And it was definitely intentional, but it was also just seeing the holes in the business and, and you know, figuratively becoming that problem solver uh, that, that did have a big heart for also multiplying people around me. Yeah, that's huge. Um, I want to come back to the multiplying people around you because I know that's a core part of your leadership style. Um, but first, I want to dig into the internal evangelist. Uh, you know, a lot of times there can be tension, sometimes healthy tension, sometimes unhealthy tension between what happens on the pre-sales side of the house. And, you know, we got to sell deals to make revenue targets and do all the fun stuff. And the post-sales side, whether it's account management, customer success, whatever you want to call it, who's responsible for serving customers and delivering value. So when when you say, you know, I really wanted to be an internal evangelist, and it sounds like you were straddling both of these, how did you um, even go about doing that? Because I know myself and prior roles and a lot of colleagues and companies that I've worked for, it's been a challenge to align these two sides of the house. How did you go about aligning these and being, how were you an internal evangelist? So I think that's where like the role design really played a big role for us. We didn't call uh, the sales engineer sales engineers. We called them solutions engineers. Mm -hmm. And we straddled that team that quickly became a department uh, across sales implementation and account management. And that team cared just as much about winning the deal as they cared about, you know, quickly getting to revenue and customer success. And so I think by nature of how I started in the business, I really developed this heart and passion for winning on both sides of the coin which then became an opportunity to help make sure that my executive team that was senior and sometimes a little further from the customer could understand some of the challenges that the business was feeling to ultimately keep, you know, the, the, the biggest impacting metrics in the business top of mind and understood. So I really mm -hmm. think that role design played a big role, role in it, at least initially. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love the fact that you combined or not combined, but you, you spread the solutions engineers across sales implementation and account management or customer success, whatever was post post sale, because it really is that right. If we can sell to the right people, ultimately, we can serve them and retain them longer, expand and renew their business and poof, everybody's happy, even though sometimes it can feel a little bit siloed in the wonderful world of the B2B. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so the, seeing the holes, uh, you mentioned that as a key element of, you know, being that internal evangelist and whatnot. Um, can you give us some, some examples of perhaps some holes that you saw? And let's talk about that. Just an example or two of some of the holes that you saw that you knew needed to be fixed based on this bigger picture vision that you had of aligning across from pre-sales to post-sales. Absolutely. I, I think one of the things that lots of technology companies struggle with is there's this internal morale and belief and conviction that our product is amazing. and. Yes. I believe Rent Dynamics is amazing. I believe our technology is great. And I think one of the natural kind of assumptions is that our technology is great. Of course, our customers are going to find the value in it on their <laughs> own. And 100%. Everybody, just turn it on and you're good. Right? They're going to they're gonna log in and they're going to become super users and they're going to be raving fans and advocates. And our pipeline is going to generate only from referrals. There you go. Yep. <laughs> and, and like, that's the goal. But I think what we kind of saw, and I'm imp implementing the same motion slowly but surely here at Rent Dynamics, is making sure that you have a plan and a strategy in place, not just for your CX organization, but for the business to operate under this motion of turning your customers into raving fans and advocates. Mm. And and I think my personal belief that that did become the gospel at G5, it's now becoming the gospel here, is making sure that you slowly get the whole business bought into that fact that we're all in the job of, of turning customers into advocates yeah. and, and, and having raving fans. And nothing should be more important than, you know, that that motion. Keeping the back door closed is important, but it's more important to make sure that that the few customers who become the many customers are what you take care of first. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. And getting a whole business bought in, um, that's something that, you know, everybody in the wonderful world of customer success and account management has struggled with at various points, right? Because they see the world from the idealistic perspective sometimes, where this is what we should be doing for our customers. This is how we should be making our customers successful. And other parts of the business, sometimes it's not the most important thing. They have other demands that are being placed on them by the business. So I love what you said there about getting everybody bought in because it's true. Like customer success and just the general term of the success of your customers is a philosophy, right? It's not a single department and it can't ever be. If it is a department and that's the only way you think about it, you're toast. Exactly. It's not going to work. You will lose customers faster than you bring them in. Yep. So let's talk about some more, um, you know, core principles from a leadership perspective that you developed while going through this rapid rise from taking over a team of two people of which you were part of, and then, you know, scaling it up to 12 people going while G5 went from 10 million to 50 million. How did you navigate that growth and both you personally, as well as your leadership with your team? So it's, it's interesting because I'd say, you know, for me, the the playbook at G5 was so different than the playbook here at Rent Dynamics because I figuratively grew up at G5 and went from an individual contributor to a frontline to a second line leader. And I'd say that one of the big things I hung my hat on at G5 that that did pay dividends for me and for the people I was responsible for developing and coaching and training was tactical and technical relevance that I had in the business and being able to multiply that. And I understood the inner workings of our business. I understood the inner workings of the objections we could expect to receive in a sale. I understood why customers would leave. And because of that, I was able to, you know, almost like help codify the good and get teams to good as fast as possible while avoiding mm-hmm. the landmines and obstacles that that many new people would would naturally fall into. And I think because I have and, 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 and had a heart for helping people get to great and ideally become better than me, uh, I think that's one of the big things that really helped at G5 was, was wanting to be someone who could say, if my value proposition's good, why not make everyone have the same thing? And if we can have mm-hmm. an army of people that are technically relevant and understanding of, of how we win and retain, that's a multiplication kind of inflection that we helped get the business to. Hmm. And yeah, that's wonderful. And I can see how that would be a cornerstone of what is necessary when going from a team of two to a team of 12, because as soon as you expand beyond a couple of people, uh, it's about consistency because there's, you know, there's not enough of you to go around. <laughs> exactly. So if someone, you know, is listening to this, regardless of level, perhaps they're at a, you know, CRO level, perhaps they're a VP, director, manager, doesn't matter. Um, and they were, you know, listening to you and it's made total sense, but they weren't exactly 100% sure about how to help somebody get from good to great or how to get help a team get from good to great. What advice would you share to help them do that? Just maybe even one step to take um, that would get them one step closer to that. One of the one of the big kind of pieces of advice I'd have for someone is to to seek feedback early and often. Mm-hmm. And I, I would say that your your kind of core group of who you're seeking feedback from is going to change naturally as your career evolves. Uh, if you're stepping into a role for the first time, you're going to probably want to go find someone who's recently done the same thing and ask them for a couple pieces of advice. And I, I think that's where, you know, being comfortable, being vulnerable is so important because sometimes you're going to maybe be asking your new team who you just inherited, hey, I need to understand your professional love language. How do you like to receive acknowledgement? Do you like it in public or do you prefer it in private? And if you get that wrong, you can really make an employee actually fizzle out, even though you think you were doing the right thing for them. Because I like public acknowledgement on stage at all hands, but not everyone else does. Mm -hmm. And so I think just being being specific, but being intentional about seeking feedback and and reducing your ego as much as possible so that you can incorporate that feedback. (laughs) Because it's one thing to ask. It's a a whole other thing to take action. But but I'd say start there in, in a big way. You made you made a reference to a professional love language. Could you elaborate on what exactly that is? So I talk about this all the time, and I always wonder if I'm going to like be not politically correct when I bring this up. But um, my wife and I, back in 2013, before we were married, we were engaged. We read this book called The Five Love Languages, yes. and it's all about understanding how you and your partner give and receive love. 
And ever since re- reading that book, it's just changed our relationship because we're polar opposites. And mm. if I try to love on April the way I want to be loved, I'm going to make her feel burned out and, and ticked off. <laughs> and so uh, I think I have the same kind of analogy in the workplace, which is that I know what my career aspirations are. And I know how my bucket feels full at the end of a day, week or month. It's, it's a shame on me to assume that the people around me, whether they're peers or subordinates or superiors, that they have the exact same kind of bucket inputs. Yeah. So I think being intentional, however you do it, to ask people you work with, like, if you're having a great day, how would you like me to tell you that? And when you're feeling like you need space, what's the best way for, for you to give me feedback? And mm-hmm. are you comfortable with direct feedback? Or are you more comfortable with indirect via email, Slack, or even a handwritten letter? And I think if you kind of bucket that, you can really cater your leadership style to how people want to be managed, which just goes such a long way, at least in my opinion. Wow. Yeah. No, that's extremely powerful. Um, and that having the courage and being vulnerable enough, as you mentioned, just to ask, like, these are not, these are not like earth shattering complex questions. This is just recognizing that the way you approach a situation is not the way that somebody else approaches a situation. And the way you like to receive recognition or feedback or whatever it is, is not the same way that everybody else does. And I love that you call that out. I think it's kind of fun. You know, professional love language is entertaining. (laughs) It's an entertaining thing. Uh, And I'm not inside of an organization, so I can say it with complete confidence and feel comfortable. I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Um, So you left G5. Um, let's talk about some of the, the the driving forces behind another major transition after several more years. Big one from Nike to G5, and then G5 to Rent Dynamics. What was the driving force behind that? And you know what what was not being met um, from a leadership perspective that you really wanted to go and do at Rent Dynamics? So I don't know if you remember Patrick Davidson. I'm sure you do. Of course. He yes. he gave me such incredible advice back in 2018. And I was this like climber and I had this climber mentality. I was always looking for the next thing, the next promotion, the next comp increase, the next opportunity. And um, what Patrick told me was so remarkable. And he told me that his career philosophy had been built around this notion of designing himself out of his job. Mm -hmm. Making the people around him and the people that he led capable of doing more than everything and removing the ego and just believing that when he designs himself out of the role, then the next role will be there. And in 2018, that became my obsession. And that multiplication kind of really took off for me because I wanted people to give better demos than me. I wanted people to give better account reviews than me. I wanted people to give better board deck presentations to our executive team than I could. And in 2020, I completed that mission. I truly like I'd hired my successor and she is world class and she's now the VP of multifamily at G5. Um, And right around the time that I was really like stabilizing the org structure, I got a phone call from Rent Dynamics and they had seen the growth of G5. They'd seen my, you know, impact from the outside looking in. And they said, Hey, want to come run the same playbook here? We're do, we're going to do something really great. And for me, it wasn't about what G5 couldn't do for me. It was what I thought I could go do for Rent Dynamics. So I genuinely felt like I wasn't leaving. I was running towards something, which just felt correct. That's awesome. No, and Patrick, I'm not surprised at all that that sage advice came from him. A phenomenal leader, a good friend, and just an amazing human being um, that I was very fortunate to have some time to get to know him when I worked with G5 and the the account management team several years ago. Um, Designing yourself out of the job. You know, some people might view that as, wait a second, if I design myself out of the job, are they going to fire me? (laughs) Am I going to get like, let go? Am I going to what, like what's on the other side? Now you, you had, you did end up stepping into another role, but even if you were, um, if someone is thinking about this from how do I apply this, but I don't want to leave my company. I'm not, I'm not trying to design my job. So I end up taking another role. How would you address that? And what advice would you share to them to embody the same mentality, but with a different outcome? So it's actually funny timing. I think it was today or yesterday you posted a uh, a excerpt from a recent podcast on your LinkedIn with a a woman who had quoted something along the lines of like, do the work that's expected of you first and spend the rest of your time doing the fun stuff. 
That's right. And, and for me, that would be the best advice. Like I, I've always thought of, of work in, in two buckets. You're working in the business or you're working on the business. Mm-hmm. And if you can stabilize, multiply and codify, make repeatable all of the in, in the business work, the, the reporting, the forecasting, the sales process, the structure, the stuff, go do the fun stuff. Because yeah. now, now that your house is in order, and even if you do want to stay once you've designed yourself out, now you're going to go find your next passion project. You're going to find where you find more energy versus the drain yeah. that you might have in your work. Yeah. And I just think that that would probably be like, she said it better than I could. Do your job first and multiply yeah. it and then go do the fun stuff. Yeah. And that, that was my chat with Alex Damgard, okay. um, a co-founder and chief education officer at, at Sales Impact Academy. Great episode. Check it out. It's in the uh, list of these. And and I agree with that 100%. And that has been a sentiment that I've followed as well for a long, long time. Um, and I was able to achieve that in my last role that I had when I was VP way back in 2014 is after a year, I essentially worked myself out of the job. And at first it was a little bit scary. I would like you was climbing. I was pushing. I always wanted the next challenge. But once the system was running, I realized that if there wasn't enough other things to get focused on in the organization I was in, it just wasn't uh, wasn't something that could happen. If there wasn't enough there, I got bored. <laughs> and, and that's a real thing. So you have to supplement with other growth areas outside of your core role, which is what kind of the point that Alex was getting, getting to and making sure that as a leader, you also foster that idea and that belief within your team and the people that work for you. Because we don't want to create a bunch of individuals who are in their roles and think that they're the only people who can fill their roles. Like, it's just not true. Exactly. People leave organizations all the time. Good things and bad things happen in life where circumstances change and you can't do your job anymore. People swap out. It's okay. But if you can automate, you know, and routinize and systematize as much as possible, then you get to work on something more fun. And chances are there's a bigger, more valuable problem that you could solve based on your expertise. Exactly. Would you agree? I couldn't agree more. And I just think that, you know, it's, it's an easy criticism when you'll see people that are clearly doing the fun stuff now before mastering the fundamentals. And it's just like, just flip the script, you know, yeah. dial, get the house in order and then go looking outside. And I just think yeah. that totally makes sense. I'm head nodding like crazy for people that are just listening to the audio. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And, and that, that notion of, of nail the fundamentals and fundamentals in this case we're talking about is like what you are responsible for today. Right. It doesn't have to be specific to any one skill set, but there is a core set of things you are responsible for that if you were to operationalize to a certain extent, you could probably accomplish those objectives in a smaller percentage of your time than you're spending on today. Absolutely. I guarantee it. I promise it. Right. I've asked that question to hundreds and hundreds of leaders and teams. If you had this is a fun thought exercise, curious for your thoughts on this. I asked them if you let's say like in a workshop kind of environment, you have 50% of your time available to accomplish the exact same job that you do today. What do you do? <laughs> Usually you get a lot of blank stares and then some ideas start rolling and everybody is able to come up with some way that they would circumvent what they're doing to do it in a more efficient way. And if we do that, then it frees up all kinds of time. What, so I love that. One of my favorite exercises to do with a new employee is this like self-awareness exercise. And it's, it's, it's very, very manual. So I say for your, your first two weeks in the job, once you're ramped, like once you've gone through training, enablement, onboarding, yep. however you want to do it, if it's on a notebook or if it's in a, a Google sheet, track how you spend your time. Yep. And in two weeks, let's review it. Yeah, And then you go through it and see how much that was tactical, how much that was strategic. What do you think? Was that good? Okay. Mm-hmm. If you have to pull all of this work out, where does it go? Yeah. And same thing, nice. people, people, they spend the first few minutes just like, well, nowhere. It's, it's too important. And by the end of the one-on-one, they're like, they've automated, they've gotten themselves 20 hours a week of productive work back and they're fired up. That's uh, that. I love that. I love that you put that in place the first two weeks immediately before any of the habits really get built. Right. We all are looking for routines and things in our work. And chances are you don't question a lot of what you do, even if you're at a C-level executive like you. Now, how often do you take a step back and look at your time and where it's going and do the same kind of exercise being CRO? 
So I don't naturally do that at all. I don't think about it because I'm such a like I'm such a driven like to do list, check off the box, get it done. Yeah. Yep. I work for a world class CEO. And his name's Quincy Rich. And he is probably like the epitome of 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 a listener and asks just the best questions ever. And he's a challenger. And I don't even know if he'd think of himself as a challenger. And I'm fortunate because I'm in the office full time since relocating to Utah. And all the time he'll ask me the question, was that the best use of your time? Mm. So I'm, you're getting it actually in the moment yeah, all the time. Because I'm new and he sees me going down a path of doing this or doing that. Yeah, and yeah. he's helping me realize where Mike should be investing his time to get the lift that Rent Dynamics needs out of me, but also how I can raise the boats of the people that I'm responsible for. Because a lot of the work that I take on could be delegated or it could be codified into a system. And so yeah. I'd say I'm really, really fortunate to have someone who sees that kind of deficiency in me. And I've yeah. got no ego with that. Like, I'm happy to say, like, no, if that was a bad use of your dollars that you just invested in me. <laughs> Let's solve for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I can make some good use of the next dollars that we invest. Exactly. So in that situation, like where are you getting this in the moment? Is he telling you where to spend your time or is he simply asking you the question, was that the best use of your time and forcing you to answer that honestly, as opposed to him giving you a solution? He's he's totally guiding me through questions, never telling me what to do because he knows yeah. that, that autonomy to me is super important. And he knows that I want to feel like it's my fingerprints, even if it's our fingerprints on how it's being built. Uh, and, and I think we could all learn a lot from that type of leadership style of, of, of if you were to have a, a conversation of me and Quincy in gong, I bet the talk ratio would be 10% Quincy, 90% me because yep. he's yep. got me solving and he's just right. helped me do it on my own. It's beautiful. He's, he's being your coach. Yeah. Right? And, and there's a great statistic that says that someone, any individual is like 80% more likely to follow through with, with a solution or an idea that they came up with as opposed to one that was given to them, even if it was the exact same idea. There's this level of ownership that all, I think all human beings possess that if it was our idea, it means more to us than if someone gave us literally the exact same words. And that is a really powerful message. Awesome to hear that it's in your CEO and you get asked the questions all the time. And I imagine you do the same thing for your team. It's sure helping me learn and it's sure helping me level up. I agree. Love it. All right. So um, sometimes people can say that uh, it's a little bit lonely at the top, right? Or in as you grow and progress through lead various leadership positions, it can be hard to find an appropriate outlet or find um, others in your organization that you can lean on, where you can openly share the challenges that you're going through without fear of either sharing too much or sharing something that's inappropriate, et cetera, et cetera. So what advice would you have for leaders, again, at any level, um, to help them with you know the network effect, I guess I would say, of some support side of things, whether it's coaching or whether it's just a peer or whatever. Is, how do you support yourself as you continue to grow and level up in organizations? It's such a good question, and and it's it's it feels kind of arrogant to say you know it gets lonely at the top, but the reality is it's true. Uh, as as your peer group gets smaller because you're not in the business, you're working majority on the business, and it just does change. You're accountable to your investors and your board as much as you are to your employees. It just changes. Yeah. And Patrick Lencioni is is someone who I've I've really read a lot of, and um, a lot here. of a lot of that came from G five in terms of the leadership teams that I worked for, eventually worked with. And I, I think one of the things that I learned from his books, but also from mentors like Patrick, was that the importance of getting to a highly functioning executive team is so critical. It is critical for the business to be able to have a plan and execute on it. It's, it's. I mean, in the great migration or great resignation right now, it's important so you can have a pulse on actually what's happening. But I think for, for me now as a, as a, a C-level officer, that's my peer group. And if mm -hmm. my peer group and I aren't connected and able to disagree and commit and, and actually talk through the things that matter, then I'm on an island. And so I think that's probably been one of my biggest like personal goals was helping shape the dynamic in our executive team because I'm I'm probably the, the, the least lonely that I've ever been because we've got such a good dynamic right now. Mm -hmm. And I think the investment in that like daily touch point with my executive team is probably the single biggest reason that my job satisfaction is, is as high as it is right now. 
That's okay. That's a really interesting point. And I think applies regardless of if you're talking about your peers or your executive team, your peers are your team, your peers are a leadership team, whatever it is, that your job satisfaction, one of the key contributing factors is so high is that level of connection and that level of rapport and camaraderie with the group that even though you have different opinions, different direction, different you know, feelings about what is going on. You have that common bond and that common connection, and that plays a huge role in wanting to stick around. Huge. That's awesome. Love it. All right, Mike. So let's take a last question here. Little trip back in the time machine. If you were to sit down with your former self, let's go back to like, you know, when you joined G5, right? And you know everything that you know right now having been through all of your incredible experiences and growth and being CRO now at Rent Dynamics, what advice would you give to your former self at that earlier stage in your leadership journey? So I thought you'd ask a question sort of similar to this. I listened to a couple episodes this morning just to like get some nails in my head. And <laughs> I, I think of everything we've talked about today, one thing I haven't mentioned is this core belief that that would probably be the the advice I'd give. 27 year old Mike when, when I joined G5 and it would be that when you join a new company or you step into a new role, there's this natural kind of intimidation that you feel because you assume that all the people around you have the answers or they've, yeah. they've been there before, or if you speak up, it's not going to be well received. And one of the best things that I've embraced is this, just this internal mantra that everyone around me is making it up as they go. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people have experience at bigger companies or they've done the playbook before, but this exact problem that we're trying to solve right now, there's a good chance it's the first time that they're having to deal with, do we save that person to let them go? Mm -hmm. And, and there is no playbook for that. You got to do the right thing. And yeah. you got to be the first person or the second person that actually raises your hand and says, this is what we got to do for the business. Yeah. And I think that really just like neutralizes the intimidation factor of stepping into a new company or a new role and really embraces my kind of biggest goal is, is just having people have high convictions. So they can have higher confidence. But if you think that everyone's making up as they go, you can step into it with a good peer, you know, peer group of mentors and take action and make things happen. Love it. Love it. What incredible advice. Just everybody's making it up as they go. And the reality is that's actually 100% true as I've found as well and firmly believer. And it's amazing how much that can put your mind at ease in situations where all the pressure and all the feelings of imposter syndrome really come from us not believing that we have a right to be in the position that we're in, even though the company already put everything behind it, offered us the job, pays us the salary, gives us the benefits, and they've already said, no, you're the right person exactly. for this position, and we question ourselves because we think we're supposed to know more than we do. I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. So that's why psychology is the source of and solution to all of our problems. I love it. <laughs> All right, Mike. Well, it has been an absolute blast. One, to catch up with you today, but two, um, just, you know, ongoing friendship. I remember our very first meeting in Bend in G5. And uh, from that point on, I was like, this guy is going to be going on doing some incredible things. So it's been amazing to see your rise and journey through G5 all the way up to CRO at Rent Dynamics. Congrats on all the progress and performance. And thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your experience and your advice for me and this audience. Thank you, Tendles. It was an honor to be on today.